Okay, so uh, thank you very much everyone for attending this webinar. Um, uh, but before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, Dr. Arbeta, Dr. Serafika, and Ms. Bahe. Um, we've done several work, uh, some work, some work on platform work in the past, and today uh, I will be discussing the platform work within the Asian context, and I've organized the presentation into five key messages. Um, the first one being, uh, next slide please. The first one being that there are um, recent developments that have changed how we live and work. And one of these developments would be the advancements in ICT and digital technology. So now we're familiar with telemigration, virtual migration. Uh, this actually predates way back in the 1980s when companies have started offshore outsourcing to take advantage of talents in low-cost nations. So we know already of BPOs and KPOs. And these outso uh, offshore outsourcing have evolved into work arrangements mediated by digital platforms. Digital platforms, they leverage technology to facilitate two things, work and the organization of work. And by doing this, they bring together uh, markets. So from the perspective of the firms, they now have access to a pool of diverse and geographically dispersed human resources, while individuals, they have now access to economic opportunities that are not available in the local labor market. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the next uh, recent development would be the COVID-19, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which certainly reshaped uh, our consumption habits. So people are less likely to go to the malls, they are less likely to travel. And these have significant impacts on employment in the micro, small and medium enterprises and the services sector. It also accelerated the digitization of work as companies implement work from home schemes. And the adoption of this telecommuting, uh, telecommuting and virtual collaboration as a new normal will definitely blur the line that separates online and offline work. Uh, and this makes sense because firms will adjust their operations to losses. Uh, therefore, they will um, uh, prefer uh, also outsourcing more. And workers will cal calibrate their preferences and evaluate their attitudes towards risk, and they will prefer online rather than offline work. Uh, next slide, please. So I was mentioning earlier uh, platforms. Uh, platforms they facilitate the demand and supply of at least uh, at least the commodities, uh, tangible goods. Uh, as exemplified by Amazon and eBay, non-tangible goods uh, as exemplified by Netflix and Spotify, and labor as exemplified by Grab and Food Panda. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Upwork and Amazon Mechanical Turk. So of these um, three platforms, probably the more uh, controversial or more problematic would be the, the digital labor platforms because these have issues in terms of social protection, skills development, and even decent work. Despite uh, these issues, um, there are uh, uh, advantages, for example, flexibilization of labor markets. So there are two sides of flexi uh, flexibilization here. Uh, the firm driven flexibility, one that allows firms to choose from a number of workers to finish short term tasks at a uh, relatively low cost and the worker driven flexibility one that allows workers to achieve work-life balance. Uh, and so here, uh, workers are their own boss and they can do the uh, work anytime, at any time, at any place. This worker-driven flexibility is um, an important selling pitch to women due to the realities of non-market work, like care economy and housework. Next slide, please. So uh, the work done on digital labor platforms are heterogeneous in terms of scope and complexity and in terms of market and reach. So what we did was uh, we came up with this figure just to have a sense of the terminologies available in the literature. And we found that there are at least two types of work, on-demand work and crowd work. On-demand work, uh, this is a work that requires close interaction between workers and demanders. This is exemplified by um, Grab and Food Panda. While crowd work, uh, this is a work that is commissioned by firms and is transact transacted and delivered online. Uh, and this is exemplified. And there are two types of work here: macro task and micro task. Macro task, these are long-term projects. They require specialized skills, but the and the final price can be negotiated. 
micro task, these are clerical in nature, routinary, and the contract price is non negotiable. In terms of the typology on economy, collaborative economy and sharing economy are terminologies that are closely associated with on demand work, while gig economy and platform economy are closely associated with crowd work. Uh, for today's presentation, we are focusing more on the crowd work, and then we are going to use platform economy as a matter of terminology. Um, next slide, please. So what have we, what what have, what have we found out uh, regarding this platform economy? We found that uh, workers they are contractors and self-employed. Uh, they don't have employer-employee relationships, and therefore they have no security benefits or or entitlement. There are also inequalities that are due to asymmetries. Value asymmetry because the value accrues most to the platform and to the firms, and the the least to the workers. Risk asymmetry because uh, the uh, training investments, uh, social protection coverage, even the production costs are borne by workers. Uh, information asymmetry because all the information is managed and controlled by the by the platform. And if there's information asymmetry, then there's also power asymmetry that's going on there. Uh, another issue is the lack of lack of collective representation. Uh, which is understandable because the workers are coming from different parts of the world and it would be difficult to uh, come together and organize a labor rights group. And then there's also an issue of discontinuity in employment because precisely because the work is contractual in short term and there's really no promise of uh, future engagement. Next slide, please. So as I was mentioning earlier, uh, there are two types of platform work, uh, crowd work and on-demand work. Uh, of between the two uh, platform work, the more difficult uh, one in terms of uh, enforcing national labor laws would be crowd work because the transactions typically cross borders and it would be difficult. To, uh, who, who are we going to go after in terms of social protection or in terms of uh, decent work or skills development? So really the question about crowd work, about the, this crowd work is how do you make uh, crowd work sustainable and how do you put decent, decent work in it? And then the question is that why do we want to do that? One is that um, uh, Mamsel already mentioned a lot of uh, benefits coming from this. Uh, in the future, it's going to be, probably become a big source of employment. That that's one. Second is that again, it's going to provide uh, opportunities to uh, people. Uh, which we uh, opportunities which might other which might or might not be available uh, in the labor market. That's one. Second is that um, this kind of work can help uh, the attainment of some SDG targets, uh, especially those relating to women, uh, women empowerment and and uh, gender in gender equality. Um, it's also possible to uh, it's also possible to address the age old conflict between market and non market work. Um, next slide, please. So key message number two, uh, there is a need to create systems for skills and training. Uh, and here we leverage online labor index to show the distribution of online work by occupation. Uh, we can see that in 2020, 50% is in software development and technology, and 20% is in creative and multimedia. Now, uh, there are jobs that are resilient uh, against uh, crises such as the ongoing pandemic, and there are uh, online work that, that have been substantially affected. And, um, the work of Stefani last year showed that jobs that are resilient would be jobs that are related to software development and technology, and those that have been sub substantially affected would be jobs that are related to creative and multimedia services and sales and marketing support. Um, and and uh, as we were saying earlier, no sales and marketing. So uh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, next slide. Okay, so here uh, on the uh, left panel, uh, we're showing uh, from the online labor index again, distribution of online work by employer. And we can see that projects are coming from North America, followed by Europe, and some uh, are coming from Asia. This is actually consistent with the earlier models of offshore outsourcing that took advantage of large pool of low cost talents in Asian countries. And in the right panel, we're showing here the distribution of online workers. Um, the, we we can see here that um, the blue part would be the uh, software development and technology that would be the biggest, uh, and the red bar red bar would be the creative and multimedia, 
uh, services. These are mostly done in Southeast and South Asia, but some are also done in the MENA region, US and the UK. So the takeaway here is that workers from countries with heterogeneous levels of income are competing for the same type of work. And so this has implications on the bargaining power of workers. And in fact, there are already studies that forwarded the idea that Crowd workers in Northern America, Europe, and Central Asia earn more than those in Africa and Asia and the Pacific. And sometimes the dichotomy is between non-Western and Western, where non-Western workers could be poorly rewarded in online work. Uh, next slide, please. And the, again, there's another problem which is uh, has something to do with labor oversupply. Uh, and th this oversupply, uh, as we know, will exert downward pressure on compensation. But more importantly, it again creates a set of challenges on the work uh, to the workers' bargaining power. Uh, and uh, we found that from the 2015 ILO survey of crowd workers, there are uh, issues like delayed communications of um, crucial instructions and getting a failing mark even after following the work requirements and specifications. And from Bang Bangladesh and in Indonesia and Pakistan, they are complaining of un unscrupulous firms who simply did not want to pay. Um, next slide, please. So here again, uh, we showed the uh, the Philippines together with its comparators, and we can see the blue bar again representing the software development and technology. The one that's resilient against uh, crisis would be highest for India, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Uh, and Vietnam. And then the red bar, which is the multimedia and creative and multimedia services, is uh, the highest for um, Indonesia, uh, Bangladesh, and uh, the Philippines. So uh, as we were saying earlier, no, this red bar or multimedia and creative services, these are not as resilient as the uh, creative, uh, sorry, the software development and technology. And one important uh, thing to notice here is the gray bar, which uh, represents the uh, data entry and uh, the data entry and clerical services, which is actually the highest for the Philippines. This is around 10%. Uh, so that means that uh, a large portion of online workers in the Philippines are still working in jobs that have low value adding. Um, next slide, please. So having said that, uh, we emphasize the importance of skills development and training support. And this is important for at least two, two groups of people. One group is though for those who consider platform work in their long-term career portfolio. So those who wanted to stay in the, on the platform, uh, the skills development and training support should be able to facilitate the shift from simple and repetitive micro tasks to high value adding macro tasks. Uh, and then um, for people who consider platform work as a temporary engagement, meaning they're just there because they're uh, pursuing other, uh, they're pursuing uh, educa uh, uh, further education or they're just, uh, they wanted to do other, other things, then uh, the experience uh, on the platform can enhance their employability in any type of work arrangement. Now, uh, here, uh, it's similar to the, probably the issue in uh, standard work arrangement, work experience is essential in, sec in securing jobs, also on platforms. Those without strong credentials may find it difficult to find uh, opportunities in the platform setting. And this is uh, probably more uh, highlighted now because there are people who are retrenched. There are many people who are retrenched and there are increasing number of job seekers. And these job seekers are, are who uh, probably have skills that are, have already been honed from their, their previous platform engagements or have already been developed from their other form of work. And so we have to do something for the Filipino online workers who are still doing some micro tasks uh, so that they can, can compete against the other, uh, other types of workers. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, going deeper into this uh, creation of systems for skills and training, um, the important thing that uh, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to emphasize here is that the skills needed on the platform are probably the same skills that are needed in the traditional work arrangement. So these are IT skills, um, inter, uh, internet skills, numeracy, literacy, communication, negotiation. So what we prob what what we probably need is to have. Uh, a, a stronger, for example, stronger communication skills, stronger nego negotiation skills. We have to be better at marketing uh, and and um, 
branding our workers, uh, we, we need to develop, uh, uh, we need to craft training to so that uh, we can develop uh, complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity. So having said that, the focus should be on the creation of a sustainable uh, ecosystem of skills program and training support. Uh, this system should be useful in any type of work arrangement. It should be used. Uh, it should be able to help both men and women prepare for the challenges brought about by this by the disruptions and uncertain uncertainties in the labor market. Now, um, uh, so there is a need for the Philippines to have a national upskilling program. Uh, and then how do we go about doing this national upskilling program? Uh, I'd like to to. Uh, say three uh, points here. The, the first point is that there are uh, countries uh, like Singapore who are successful in their upskilling program. They have the Skills Future and uh, the uh, a Skills Future program. It provides comprehensive mapping of resources on education, career, and training. Uh, and so a clerk who probably wanted to become a computer programmer will be guided by it had it, it it will show the pathways it will show the skills required and the good thing about this is that the government is all there there are subsidies to all singaporeans so that they can pursue uh, skills and reskilling and upskilling uh, and even pursuing lifelong learning another uh, uh, important feature of this one is that uh, the PRMs are mandated to uh, set aside some funds for the workers, uh, work for their workers' uh, uh, skills mastery and pursuit of lifelong learning. So the per first point is that we can learn uh, from the Singaporean experience in terms of uh, in terms of uh, best practices, in terms of uh, their experiences, what are the needed, what are the uh, resources needed, who are the actors, uh, what will it take in order to set up this kind of, of uh, program, and what will it take to maintain it? Uh, that that's the first one. The second is that uh, as we think about uh, of, about this national upskilling program, we need to leverage uh, digital platforms to develop uh, skills and training systems uh, in order to. Uh, bring together uh, public and private uh, sector. So this has to be a whole of society approach. Uh, it has to be a collaboration uh, between, among rather, among uh, government, academe, industry, workers association, and training uh, providers, um, uh, private and public. So it ensures the, the continuity of the skill system when there's collaboration. It strengthens the sharing of information, tools, and resources as the system evolves. Um, collaboration here is key uh, because it allows the collection and analysis of data to improve the provision of services. That's one. Second is the identification of additional programs in order for us to respond to the evolving needs of the local and global uh, labor markets. The third one is that it, it, uh, collaboration also allows forging new devel uh, new collaborations with other, other actors, like for example, industry practitioners becoming tra training providers as well. And then the fourth one is that it, it also allows the development of uh, financing strategies uh, uh, in order to, to, uh, to financing strategies uh, for the, uh, of the uh, workers' skills needs. So the third point is that um, there are already existing government programs and initiatives uh, to set up the skills and training systems. And, and I'm just going to mention, I'm sure there are other uh, uh, government programs and initiatives, but I'm only going to mention uh, three. Um, the, D, the DICT's Digital Jobs PH program, that's one. Uh, it conducts training to equip Filipinos with ICT related skills to assist economically disadvantaged areas, especially in the countryside and rural communities. Uh, and the second one is we have the qualifications framework. So this qualifications framework or uh, uh, PQF, Philippine uh, Qualifications Framework, it describes the level of educational qualifications and sets the standard for qualification outcomes. And then the third one, we have the Philippine Talent Map Initiative by the Dole, it determines the strength and weaknesses of the current workforce uh, and it, uh, to, in order of, uh, to address job skills mismatch through a competency-based assessment. So in terms of 
of building blocks there we already have uh these building blocks uh but we only have for example to probably come together the, for these things to, these to come together coupled with understanding of the experiences and best practices of the singapore of the singapore uh, skills future then probably we can come up with a good national upskilling program um uh, next uh, slide please so key message number three, there is a need to design a social protection system that covers all types of work uh, arrangement. And as I have uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the one, one issue here is that uh, workers are con considered uh, contractors or self-employed, and therefore they do not have security benefits and protection entitlements. Uh, next slide, please. So um, there are certain segments of the population that are more likely to be drawn to online work. One is uh, young people and the other and the other group is women. Young people, uh, they are more likely to be drawn to this kind of work because they are technologically savvy people. They uh, know the internet, they, they know online tools and resources. Uh, and they uh, belong to the to a network of so equally social equally um, uh, technologically savvy people as uh, equally savvy people and therefore they are more likely to be drawn to this online work now uh, there are issues in terms uh, of this age composition of platform workers because it can result in the uh, in the erosion of contribution base of, uh, of the social protection schemes uh, it therefore it can result in increasing coverage gaps uh, weakening of the sustainability of social protection schemes and, and issues on financing future entitlements because as more and more people are, are going into this online work then um, and, and the, they, they don't contribute to any sort of social protection scheme. So the, there might be some issues in terms of future entitlement, uh, financing uh, uh, future entitlements, increasing coverage gap, and this can result in the straining of public finance because of social assistance to the unemployed and in between jobs. Um, more importantly, it can also uh, result in the crowding, crowding out of other government programs, especially in the time of uh, the crisis. Uh, women are also more likely to be drawn to online work precisely because of the idea of flexibility. Um, so this gender composition of platform workers can exacerbate gender inequalities. We know that here in the Philippines, social protection is tied to formal employment. And 50% uh, of women are not in the labor force. And those who end up working, 50% are on account. So more likely not covered by any social protection scheme. Uh, next slide, please. So there are suggestions from various fronts. One would be the decoupling of social protection from employment, but there are issues here. Uh, one is that some workers may not be able to accumulate sufficient entitlements due to, to their work uh, and income patterns, and therefore um, inadequate coverage. It can result in inadequate coverage and benefits. Uh, second is that if we do that, if we decouple social protection from uh, employment, we can we will be giving too much role to private entities, and we might end up not providing any protection to the uh, to the people who want who we wanted to have protection to begin with. Um, uh, lastly, it can also result in the weakening of the employer's responsibility towards their workers, which is something that the decent work is uh, preventing. Uh, and then a suggestion as well regarding the universal basic income. Uh, issues here would be the benefit levels may not be enough to cover a standard, uh, uh, standard of, uh, decent standard of living. Uh, the more, more importantly would be the crowding out of uh, the financing of other public services. So if, if we, before we can even begin to think of uh, implementing this, there has to be a nuanced analysis. Uh, having said that, um, next slide please. Having said that, we uh, were able to compile some desirables or desirable uh, features of a social protection system. Uh, there are four uh, uh, features here, universal uh, and equal, uh, and equal uh, access and flexibility. Uh, fle flexibly designed. Um, so this means that there has to be a flexible eligibility definition, one that covers work in any work arrangements and can be uh, customized to accommodate the needs and preferences of workers. The second it ha is it has to be portable, agile, and transferable. Uh, it should recognize the idea that workers can move in 
in and out of certain types of work uh, in response to local and global labor markets. The third one would be uh, um, it, it this social protection system need to be integrated, needs to be integrated with allied services and programs. So for example, we were, so for uh, example, unemployment insurance, that is going to be a social protection. But this unemployment insurance should not only provide uh, uh, minimum income while the person is unemployed, but it should also cover reskilling and upskilling training costs to facilitate movement in between in between jobs. So there has to be um, a link of social protection and skills development systems. And lastly, um, uh, social protection system needs to be facilitated by technology, meaning leveraging technology to facilitate enrollment, payment of uh, contribution, uh, payment of benefits, and even providing uh, not just uh, uh, like texting uh, people to provide nudges uh, so that they will be encouraged more uh, in in uh, in uh, contributing to the, the to the social protection scheme and uh, next slide please Okay, key message number four, um, Asian nations can explore the platform economy as an area of cooperation. And we've already said that there are some problems for, uh, for, uh, that are uh, encountered by Asian uh, workers. Uh, they have lower wages for Asian workers and there are rejection of outputs. Uh, there's also the lack of grievance mechanisms or mechanisms for dispute resolution. Um, so in a standard work arrangement, it's a lot, it's very easy for workers to organize labor groups into labor groups. Labor groups are very important uh, because these provide a voice for uh, advocacy and negotiation. Now, in terms of platform uh, workers, or online workers, they are geographically, geographically dispersed and anonymous uh, pool of platform workers who are likely to, to view each other as competitors. And therefore, mounting a call to action or even organizing a labor rights group can be really a challenge. And so um, there has to be a way for, the, for these issues to be collectively addressed, uh, to collectively address critical issues. So, so uh, Asian nations can, can come together so that um, they can influence the narrative from competition to collaboration and to influence unfavorable practices such as underbidding and race to the bottom uh, mentality. Uh, key message uh, number five, next slide please. Key message number five, the last uh, message is that there is a need to improve the visibility of platform work to fill in critical knowledge gaps. Uh, and this, uh, this, visib this visibility is key uh, in terms, uh, sorry, uh, key to visibility is data, which we currently do not have. And therefore, we need to define platform work. We need to classify the range of economic activities in platform work. The absence of, of definition and uh, the absence of classification contributes to challenges in data collection and measurement. There is a need for us to have um, uh, definition, classification, and then we need to have a methodology in order to collect data. We need to collect data and then we can measure and we can analyze. Now we can include a module of platform work as a rider to the LFS, but um, Doing that may not be adequate to capture the scope and complexity of, of existing work arrangements in the platform. And then last two things here that I'd like to say is that uh, tracking down, uh, there are challenges in terms of collecting data. One is tracking down platform workers uh, would be very, would be a challenge. Second is that enticing them to participate and truthfully disclose information uh, would would also be a challenge, especially on the heels of potential taxation of the online economy. I think that is the last slide. Yeah, that is the last slide. Thank you very much for listening.